Hey everybody, welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. Well, we've got a bunch of updates for you today along with answers to a lot of the questions that we've been getting over the last month. About once a month, we like to do one of these question and answer videos where we take questions that you guys have directly asked us on other videos or, or through our social media and answer those for you uh, the best that we can. We use this style rather than the live videos because we really don't have very good internet here. And so this is the best way that we have to communicate with you all and answer your questions. That may be changing in the future though because we are testing out a new internet service in the next week or so. And if it works well, we may be able to start doing some live streams for you guys. But we have heard a lot of your concerns about live streaming and how it's typically done. So if we do start doing live stream videos, please know that it will be nothing like you've seen before. We've been throwing around some ideas. If it all works out, we'll be bringing you some awesome live footage from the farm. But for today, we're gonna start off by talking about Hope, our Jersey cow, who just had a calf last week. If you haven't seen the video where we almost lost her due to milk fever, go back and watch that video. But she is doing great now. We're gonna take a walk in her pen and we're gonna see how she's doing today. I hope. How are you this morning? I know, those flies. You can see that Hope is doing great. She's back to her old self. She did have one more little bout of milk fever the following day after we put out the video for you guys. Uh, that following evening, she started to not act quite right again. Uh, so we had to give her, we didn't have to have the vet back out. She never was down like she was before. She was just, she, she wouldn't eat her grain that night on the milking stand and we knew something was wrong. We were able to give her some oral CMPK paste uh, and that got her through. We gave her two tubes of that and within a couple hours she was back to normal and she has been normal ever since. So that was uh, several days ago. So we're, we're sure now that she's going to be fine. Uh, in the future, we will be taking some preventative measures uh, either just before she calves or just after she calves to hopefully uh, reduce her risk of getting milk fever again in the future. But she is doing great and you can see her calf right back there. Now in the last video, we never said if it was a boy or a girl, a lot of you figured it out. Those of you who know what you're looking for, but for those of you who didn't, uh, it is a boy. Uh, we've decided to name him Henry. And Henry will be here with us on the farm for probably a year and a half, uh, but eventually he will be food for our family. Now we've had Hope and Henry locked up in this little area right in front of the barn. Well, Hope's been in here for about two weeks. Henry was born eight days ago. And this area honestly is only about a quarter of an acre and it's about out of grass for Hope. So today we're gonna let Hope and Henry back out into this huge pasture behind me where they will never run out of grass because it's way more than one cow and a calf could ever eat. So we're gonna open the gate right here. And we're gonna let her back out and I bet she is going to be in heaven. She's been staring out that gate for the last couple of days looking at the grass on the other side of the fence. Let's go let her out. Oh, you wanna get back out? Come on, Hope. Here we go, Hope. There you go.
Well, they really seem to be enjoying out here in this pasture. They can just roam and eat and run and play until they're too tired to do it anymore. Which is exactly what happened. Henry's already laid down for a nap in some tall grass and Hope is continuing to graze. Now all of this with Hope over the last eight days has all been brand new experiences for us. And as much as you try to prepare and read and talk with people uh, who have also had this experience before, it, there's just nothing like experiencing it yourself and learning firsthand. There are a lot of things that we have learned over the last eight days uh, some things we were prepared for and other things we just weren't. This is the very first calf we've ever had born on our homestead. And because of that, there were a lot of new things. For instance, we decided that we were going to band uh, Henry to make him into a steer instead of keeping him as a bull calf because we're gonna be raising him for meat. So we actually banded Henry yesterday. Uh, that was uh, actually not too bad of an experience for us or for him he was pretty calm uh, we got the band on him no problem and so uh, you can see that already by today it's not affecting him at all he's out running around and playing just like normal we had done that many times with goats but we had imagined that it was going to be just a ton harder to do with a calf but actually it went really well we were both surprised and wondering what we are worrying so much about. Yeah, the only thing I would do different is I think next time I'll do it just when they're one or two days old or as soon as we possibly can, instead of waiting a whole week, because uh, he is pretty strong already, but like I said, it went very smoothly. Another new experience for us was trying to figure out when we should start milking Hope and how often. There's a lot of conflicting information online and talking to different people. Everybody just does it a little bit differently. So it has ended up that the best thing for us and for Hope right now is that we are milking her in the evening once a day. We're not separating the calf at all right now. Uh, but her milk is just starting to come in. It's just switched over from colostrum to milk. So as her milk comes in more and more, we may have to make a change. But right now, once a day, and she's producing beautifully. Last night when we milked her, we ended up with about two and a half gallons of milk. Uh, and that was after, you know, Henry had been drinking all day. So we were really happy with that. But it does seem like it is going to keep increasing. The previous owner that we got her from actually said at, some, at one point she was producing five gallons of milk a day on top of what the calf was drinking. So it looks like she's going to be producing plenty of milk for our family and having plenty for Henry as well. Another update that we need to share with you guys and that is concerning our ducks. You may have just noticed those of you who are watching carefully that we no longer have seven ducks like we used to. We now only have three. About two weeks ago we started seeing from time to time a coyote uh, over here on this side of our homestead and he would stay kind of far away but we were watching him and one day all of a sudden four of our ducks didn't come back up at night to be locked up in their hoop coop. We searched all over that night with flashlights because sometimes the ducks will try to hide in the bushes and sleep in the bushes overnight or they have a nest of eggs that they go broody and want to stay there and sit on those eggs. So we looked everywhere uh, that night and they never turned up. The next morning we thought, well, maybe they'll come up to the pond and swim and drink, or maybe they'll come up to the feed bowl, but they never did come back. We're down to three ducks. Now we're assuming that the coyote is who got the ducks uh, right in the middle of the day. Uh, we really didn't think it was gonna be a problem with the coyote because like Sarah said, we've only ever seen him way off in the distance prior to that and we just didn't think he'd come up near where we spend a lot of time during the day, but I guess on that one day he was feeling confident and came up. 
But luckily, shortly thereafter, I was able to sit out here one evening. Uh, I actually sat up in the top of our milking barn, opened one of the big windows in the top of the milking barn. The coyote came up and I was able to shoot him. And so he's no longer a threat to our animals. And uh, since that time, we've had no more problems. We haven't seen any other coyotes around. Uh, we do, you know, we live far out in the country. So there are a lot of coyotes around. But 99% of the time, they're, you only hear them at night, and they're way off back in the woods somewhere. It's rare that one actually gets brave enough to start coming up onto the farm itself. So uh, we're confident that we got this one out of the way, and there won't be any more problems. This coming spring, we plan to get some more ducklings, either from a hatchery, or we can hatch some of our own eggs. Going into the winter, it's gonna be cold, and uh, we'd rather start with new ducklings in the spring. But we love ducks. We can't wait to have more and do plan to add more to the homestead. Well, let's switch our focus away from animals for just a little while, and let's move on to our gardens. Now, our summer gardening season is pretty much over at this point, except for our row of peppers, which are still producing a ton of peppers, but everything else in the garden at this point is done. We've been getting questions about a fall garden and if we're going to be planting a fall garden. And actually, we will not be planting a fall garden. We're going to be concentrating our attention on growing in our greenhouse over the winter. Now, in our greenhouse, we do have a large raised bed garden. It's six feet wide by 22 feet long. And we'll be growing a lot of different things in there over the winter. But this winter, we're really going to focus on growing greens for our family. We've learned over the last few years how much we really enjoy having fresh greens over the winter. And that's why we're gonna be concentrating on growing mostly those things in the greenhouse. We absolutely love having fresh lettuce, fresh spinach over the winter, and you never know what else we're going to be growing in there. We haven't quite decided 100%. We did a little bit of experimenting last winter with planting things like radishes and turnips. Uh, even in the coldest part of our Missouri winters, we were able to get those things to germinate from seed right in the greenhouse. So uh, we'll be playing around with a few more of those really cold hardy plants again this year, uh, learning which seeds will germinate uh, you know, at the coldest temperatures. And we're really gonna concentrate on those things over winter. So we're excited to bring you guys along as we really learn more and more about how to utilize our greenhouse or our hoop house uh, over those winter months. By focusing our efforts growing in our greenhouse over the winter, it allows us to put the summer garden to bed and start amending the soil and putting more organic things into that soil to make it just better and better every year. If you watched our previous video where we dug our sweet potatoes, our native soil here in Missouri just basically turns to concrete over the summer. Even though we have a drip irrigation system, we till it in the, in the spring to loosen everything up. By the end of summer, when we get to having to dig things like sweet potatoes, uh, the ground is just absolutely hard clay and a pain in the rear end <laughs> to dig up. But we asked for your advice in that video about what you think we should do. Should we add sand? What should we do to break this up? We got lots of suggestions. We appreciate that so much. So over the fall and winter, we're gonna concentrate our efforts in amending that soil to make it so much better for the next growing season. We're hoping to get lots of organic matter tilled into that and then let it rest all winter long so by next spring uh, a lot of that will be broken down and we'll have a great place to plant. We'll still be using the woven weed cover on top of the garden next year but with that nicely amended soil underneath. While we're on the subject of the garden we want to talk about how things turned out overall with our sweet corn. A lot of you expressed to us that you thought we planted way too much sweet corn for a family of four this year. We planted 15 50 foot rows of the peaches and cream sweet corn. And uh, you know, a lot of you said that that was gonna be way, way, way too much corn for our family of four to eat. I think if our main concern with the sweet corn was to eat it fresh right when it is coming out of the garden, that would be true that we planted way too much. But our primary concern is 
preserving that corn so it would be a year's worth of corn for our family of four. And that is a lot of corn. We love corn. Now we did eat quite a bit of it fresh and we had family and we ate until our bellies were full. Right, we shared some with some neighbors and we did freeze some right on the cobs. Yeah, uh, but for long-term storage, we you know, we prefer to do canning because it will last for a long time and it doesn't take up a lot of freezer space. And those 15 rows did not produce enough for our family for one year. Now I plan how much we need to, you know, preserve for a year by how many times a week we want to eat that food. So I would like to serve our family at least once a week some corn. Our family, if we're not uh, restricting how much we would eat, we would eat an entire quart of corn. For the four of us. For the four of us, uh, for one meal. This year's preserving, I preserved in pints and we didn't even get 52 pints of corn. We got about 48 pints of corn. So next year we need more sweet corn. Now one mistake that we did make this year is planting it all at once. Like I said, we planted 15 rows this year and we planted them all on the same day. In hindsight, we should have stagger planted those a little bit. Next year, I think we're gonna try planting 24 rows and I'm gonna do eight rows, then wait two weeks, plant another eight rows, wait two weeks and plant another eight rows. And that will spread out the amount of work that it is to harvest all of that, you know, so we'll have more time to process. The amount of work wasn't overwhelming, but if we need to add eight more rows, having all of that corn come in at once, that would be an overwhelming task. One thing that we did learn this year is that pretty much when sweet corn is ready to harvest, you've got a window of about five days to get all of that corn out of the garden to, for it to be in its prime. So this year we had to pick all 15 of those rows, not only pick them, but you know, cut it all off the cob, can it, or freeze it or whatever we we're gonna do, all of that within a five day window. And that was, I mean, it, it wasn't so much that we couldn't do it, but it was a lot of work to get done in such a short amount of time. Right, so that is one thing that we learned. And you know, this year was the first time that we were really successful planting sweet corn. What a huge blessing to have all of that sweet corn. We've learned a ton and we're going to use that knowledge next year to even plant more. Right, and we'll feel more confident next year about showing you guys what we've learned uh, now that we've had a, what I would consider a very successful year with it. We'll share with you guys the way that we did it so that hopefully you can have a successful year next year as well. And now that the gardening season is winding down, we've done some seed saving and we did a little bit of video about us saving seeds. Since that video, we have received a lot of questions um, on that video, in emails, on other social media about seeds for next year and concerns that right now when people are trying to order seeds, like in this very month of September, the seed companies are sold out. A lot of you are concerned that that means there's a seed shortage and that, you know, even next year, seed companies aren't gonna have any seeds to sell. Now that may very well be true. We can't predict the future, but what we can tell you is learning from past experience that the seed, having the seed companies be short on seeds this time of year at the end of the growing season is not unusual. This is the time of year that not only are we saving seeds, but the farmers that supply the seed companies with their seeds, they're also gathering their seeds, putting them together and sending them to the seeds to the seed companies. Our perspective on all of this really changed last year when we grew some seeds for Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. Uh, up until then, we never really understood how the whole process worked. Uh, so we spent some time actually at Baker Creek uh, touring the facilities, learning the entire process of what happens when the farmer actually sends seeds to the company and what happens once it gets there until it gets ready to send out. And it's really pretty extraordinary to, to watch the whole process. Like when we grew seeds for them last year, we grew eggplant and tomato seeds for them. We actually ba basically sent them seeds in an envelope. Once they arrive at Baker Creek, someone has to physically take those seeds uh, they take some of the seeds out of every package that they get and they try to plant uh, some of those seeds 
to see how many of them will actually germinate and then they rate those and there's actually a federal standard that those seeds have to meet in order to be sold by a seed company. So it's pretty stringent guidelines uh, and that takes some time for them to do all of that work. Once the seeds actually make it through that testing, then they can start figuring out how many of each type of seed they have, putting them into packages, and then actually getting them into inventory to send out to everybody else who wants to buy them for the following year. So while we are definitely advocates for being prepared and planning ahead, with the seeds, we need to just give the seed companies uh, the time that they need to gather their seeds and get them ready for purchase. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't be saving right. seeds because by saving your own seeds, it's a guaranteed thing that you're going to have seeds for next year. Right. So like I said, we, we're not saying we can predict the future and that for sure the seed companies will have seeds next year. There's a good chance if just as many new gardeners get into gardening next year as this year, uh, that you know there may be shortages again. There may be companies running out of seeds. So uh, by no means, you know, don't rely on other people. If you can rely on yourself, uh, do that. That's always best because then you know what you have. And the last thing we want to talk about today is that the day you are seeing this will be a bittersweet day on the homestead. My parents have been here for the entire summer. They came from Arizona uh, to stay here on the farm with us. And they've been here for a little over two months now. And today they're actually heading back to Arizona. Now the reason that that is kind of bittersweet is because we're gonna miss them while they're gone. But while they were here, they've actually fallen in love with the life that we're living out here in Missouri. And they've decided to move out here to be with us full time. So they're going back to Arizona actually to start packing, getting their house ready to sell, and then they're going to be moving here to Missouri to be by us, be by their grandkids, and to also be able to live more of a simple life out here in the country. We had no idea that this would happen. We actually felt like we needed to convince them just to come for the summer. We didn't pressure them at all about moving, but we made it known that we would like that. And in the end, they decided, they surprised us one day and said they decided to move and we couldn't be happier. It's funny how things all kind of work out. Early, early this spring, before any of this COVID-19 stuff even started, we were planning our gardens and Sarah said, you know, I just have a feeling that we should plant some extra things this year and produce more than normal. Uh, and when we were planning to raise our pigs for this year, we always raise two pigs for our family. But for some reason this year we said, you know what, let's raise three pigs this year. So we had no idea why we were kind of feeling this need to produce even more uh, food than normal. And then the opportunity came for us to buy this additional land. And on the land is a house. We didn't need a second house and really, uh, we weren't really in the market to buy a property that had a house on it, but the property, the land itself is so beautiful and exactly what we wanted. So we worked out a deal. We purchased the property with the house. We had no idea what we would be doing with the house. And then all of this COVID-19 stuff started and it presented itself that mom and dad were able to come out here, live in this extra house that we had and be able to spend time with us and you know it just everything just worked out so perfectly we couldn't have planned anything better had we been able to predict the future way back last winter it's amazing how god can really just put some things on your heart and when you listen and obey and do the things that you know you should just how amazing the blessings can be we couldn't have ever imagined that this would happen. It's such a blessing and we cannot wait for them to hurry up, pack up and get back. So that is where we're gonna end today's video. Uh, we're so excited that you guys are following along as we live a more simple life out here in the country. We hope that you will share our videos across your social media so that other people may also learn that there is a way to get out of the rat race and live a simple life in the country. Raise your own food, raise your kids, and spend time with family. Until next time, guys, thanks so much for stopping by our homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.